Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, and let's get back into something I talked about a little bit ago. So when we kind of had the whole uh, DLCs revealed, and we were talking about Shadows of Change, and Thrones of Decay, and all those other things, I mentioned that I wanted to also do some other videos talking about things that I would like to see in the future, particularly when we talked about the corn video. I still kind of feel that Korn, you know, it's a total toss up who he's going to be facing off against in his DLC, whether I think the predictions that I made were like, it could be undead themed with tomb Kings and vampire counts, or it could be more just kind of like big brawl themed with green skins and ogre kingdoms. And in the video and right now, I still feel very strongly that green skins and ogres would fit much better thematically. It would also make for a more enjoyable DLC. Um, and I think that that level of pack, granted, we, we're not 100% sure what's in the upcoming Shadows of Change yet, uh, but hopefully it's kind of comparable to a Lord pack as far as like the number of units and the amount of new content, um, which would be much more fitting for the Greenskins and the Ogres versus uh, the Tomb Kings and the Vampire Counts. Not. Granted, I think the Tomb Kings would also work well with that, but the vampire counts are what I want to talk about. And what I said in that video, and I'm doing now, is that I wanted to make a video talking about what I would like to see for the vampire counts. And for me, the thing I really want to see from the vampires is a Champions of Chaos level DLC that could be called, you know, uh, Vampiric Bloodlines or bloodlines of vampires or I don't know, uh, whatever, some fancy name. But for me, the vampire counts are in many ways, like the forces of chaos, very determined by kind of the way they're divided into notable subgroups being the five bloodlines, just like the forces of chaos are notably divided into their five sub factions of the mono God followers and then undivided. I feel the same way about the vampire counts being that you have von Karstein's blood dragons, Lamians, Necrarchs, and Strigoi. And in the total war Warhammer trilogy thus far, we've basically just have von Karstein's, um, exclusively. There are non von Karstein characters in the game, but none of them are genuinely playable characters. And they're just kind of there. They don't really, you know, they're, they're not, you know, we have the red Duke, but he's not playable. We have Neferata's faction, but she's not there. We have a notable Strigoi faction down in the marshes of madness, but, and it's even, I think if I recall correctly, now it's led by a Strigoi ghoul King, but uh, he doesn't really have a name. I think he's just the Ghoul King, which kind of, you know, it could be alluding to Vorag. It could be alluding to Ushorin. But, other, you know, there, none of the characters we all really want to see are there. They're all just kind of villains or uh, represented by lesser material. And the Vampire Counts are really one of those factions that have so much material still available to be added into the game that in my opinion, they are one of only two races that I think you could justify doing a champions of chaos style DLC for the other being the green skins, uh, which will be kind of a future topic though. The green skins are significantly more complicated, uh, because we actually have gotten a lot of the content of like all the different subs, uh, subspecies. It's just that the green skins had such a, Freaking massive roster compared to like the green skin roster dominates every single of the roster in the game. Nobody even comes close to having as many units. Um, and that's even before you start talking about alternate weapon types of the same unit, which every faction, but the green skins has. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that'll be another topic for a later time. But today I want to start talking about vampire counts. And I think to kind of fit uh, along with how we were doing the chaos type DLC, each video I'm going to dedicate to a different bloodline. That way these videos can kind of remain bite-sized and not get too crazy. And I am able to kind of just laser focus on the, uh, 
one faction at a time, it's legendary Lord and all those other uh, systems. So today I'm going to start with my personal favorite, uh, my absolute favorite of the bloodlines, which are the Necrarchs. I have talked about them many a time, but first let's kind of lay out how I imagine this kind of DLC would work. So with the champions of chaos, what we functionally got was they, they, it was kind of a clever DLC in that it ex very heavily expanded the warriors of chaos without really adding in a ton of new units per se. Um, like there, it, it didn't, it didn't like there was a ton of new assets added. There was a ton of new dialogue or uh, voice lines added. There was a ton of new characters, uh, legendary Lords and such added. They, they did a really good job with just stuffing it full. Uh, but there wasn't like a lot of genuinely a hundred percent brand new units with, um, uh, the only the real things that we got being the the chaos war shrine, uh, but at the same time, like you could argue that so many of those units were drastically different from their undivided versions that they might as well have been new units, and I would agree with that, especially because of the amount of like unique assets that they brought into the game to make themselves uh, look unique. They brought a lot of new systems into the game, um, and they also kind of like took the demon systems, but they didn't one for one them. They also expanded upon them. Uh, and made them more exciting. So when I look at a potential, uh, we'll call it, we'll call it, uh, vampiric bloodlines. We'll just say that's the name vampiric bloodlines. Very simple, straightforward. Um, when we look at what the structure would look like, I think it's really important when doing these kinds of prediction videos, at least in my opinion, to try and keep things manageable, try and keep things kind of compact and not just go off the deep end with wishes. Uh, because I think it becomes counterproductive, uh, because then you go from talking about things that could potentially, uh, realistically happen to things that are so just ridiculously out in left field that anyone that may have the ability to watch the video and go, Oh yeah, we should do this. We'll just tune out completely. So with that in mind, I'm going to be trying my best to suggest, uh, mechanics and ideas that as much as possible draw on things that we already have in the game. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still going to be suggesting brand new units, uh, and, uh, new ideas. However, I'm not going to be just like spewing out whatever absolute nonsense I could think of off the top of my head, because once again, I, I could do that, but I don't think there's any, uh, <laughs> I don't think there's success to be found down that particular route. So, Without any further ado, um, my kind of plan is that I think it's reasonable to think of a legendary lord for each bloodline, then a generic lord or hero, because I think they would probably be shared much more widely. And really for the lords and heroes, I'm going to be honest, I'm really just going to be focusing on how to make the bloodline characters better. Um, so, you know, taking the generic vampire heroes and maybe really running with the idea of creating heroic versions of each of the bloodlines and then taking the Lord version of the bloodline Lords and, you know, spicing them up a little bit. Then from there, I would say two to three units at maximum for each of the bloodlines and one potentially big thing. Um, not for all of them necessarily. So don't like don't get me wrong, I'm not going to suggest a big monstrous creature for each bloodline because I don't think that would happen. Uh, I think at max I'm going to suggest two big creatures, uh, but uh, you'll see as we get into it. And then we'll talk like mechanics and stuff. So, starting with the Legendary Lord, uh, for the Necrarchs, it's painfully obvious. Uh, I really think for all the bloodlines it's painfully obvious, except for maybe two of them, which I guess would be half. So, it, it, anyway, Zacharias the Everliving. So for those that don't know, Zacharias the Everliving uh, is my favorite vampire, but he is also the absolute big badass of the Necrock bloodline. And he is, I would say, the most powerful vampire there is, only contended uh, against the likes of Aberash and Manfred von Karstein, if we're looking at kind of like the modern era. Because uh, we would be assuming that Vlad is not alive in that kind of little subset. In any event... Who is Zacharias? Well, to give a brief history, so this video doesn't end up being an hour long, um, Zacharias the Everliving uh, actually has a pretty interesting story. He was born and raised in the Empire. Uh, he seemed to have been, uh, we're not exactly sure where in the Empire he was born, 
but he does seem to be native to somewhere in the ballpark of Nordland or Midland, as when he was an adult, he ended up getting into necromancy, and Zacharias definitely had a very, very strong gift for magic and sorcery. Um, he was very, very gifted at detecting the winds of magic and being able to see them and like follow their lines and interpret them. He had a profound gift for it. And he ended up finding himself uh, in his pursuit of necromancy, taking on the role of a student to none other than Dietrich uh, Dieter Helschnitt, not Dietrich, uh, Dieter Helschnitt, the Doom Lord of Mindheim, which uh, Dieter Helschnitt is a super badass character. He's who we should have gotten instead of Gorst. I don't think we're ever going to get him as a playable character in Total War because Gorst kind of took his spot. But um, the, the really important thing to just know about Helschnitt is that Helschnitt has been around for hundreds of years at this point. Uh, he's a very, very powerful necromancer. Uh, one of the strongest in the lore outside who is like still a living necromancer uh, next to only the likes of Heinrich Kimmler. Uh, I would say Kimmler is a little more powerful, but uh, Helschnitt also rides a manticore, which is very unique. <laughs> also, <coughs> excuse me. Also, he has a very peculiar thing where he likes to eat people's brains. Uh, Dieter Helschnitt is really possessed of the idea that you can acquire someone's knowledge like by literally eating their brain. So he runs around killing other necromancers and then gobbling down their, their, uh, their brainy bits because he thinks that it will empower him further from what seems to occur. It doesn't really seem to play out for him that well, but you know, whatever he ends up becoming one of the nine more Tarks of Nagash in the end time. So I, I guess <laughs> in any event, um, so Zacharias signs up and Zacharias, uh, ha is kind of like, a um, He's not insanely old. He, he hasn't been around for a crazy long time. Uh, he might have been around um, before kind of the modern era, but not by much. Um, actually, no, he has been around for a little while, but like no more than a few centuries. Um, but in any event, so Zacharias takes up residence with the Doom Lord. He starts learning from him. And something that kind of happens is that Zacharias is very ambitious. He wants to learn a lot about necromancy. He wants to master the art and become incredibly powerful. However, one thing that he notices that he dislikes about Helschnitt is that Helschnitt isn't really a very good teacher. Uh, Dieter Helschnitt is far more concerned and obsessed with getting his revenge on Middenheim and waging war against uh, Nordland, especially Salzenmund. So Helschnitt is just going crazy on constantly raising armies, attacking various cities, and using um, the uh, the Forest of Shadows and the Drakwald, kind of mainly the Forest of Shadows, as this, this base of operations uh, to just launch assaults on those he believes have wronged him in the past. And he is utterly obsessed with this revenge plot to the point that he kind of stops um, really delving deeper into the secrets of necromancy, you know, instead of becoming even more powerful and maybe even going down the lines of becoming one day a lich or something along those lines, he kind of just settles really comfortably into his role of a master necromancer and just does everything in his power to destroy the empire that he feels, uh, betrayed him so many years ago. So Zacharias kind of sees where this plot thread is going and notes that it doesn't really leave a lot of space for him. Um, or his advancement. So as they're kind of doing their various works in the Forest of Shadows, Zacharias notices something that Helshant never did, which is that the Forest of Shadows is very, uh, it is, it's scarred by necromancy. With those who are really proficient in necromancy, they can tell when acts of great um, uh, rituals or summonings have been performed in an area by other necromancers or vampires. And it becomes very clear to Zacharias that there's something else going on in the Forest of Shadows. Helschnitt didn't notice because he's completely insane. Like, Helschnitt is completely out of his mind by this point. Um, and he's too busy focusing on other matters. So Zacharias kind of sneaks away from uh, Dieter and ends up discovering a fortress, uh, a keep, hidden deep within the Forest of Shadows, covered by magic so that no one can find it. And he observes it for a while and becomes very keenly aware that it is 
run by some extremely powerful uh, individual skilled in the necromantic arts because it's guarded by undead. So it has many different whites and skeletons and zombies protecting it and kind of always on the lookout for trespassers. So Zacharias studies it, uh, I believe, for a few weeks and eventually comes up with the and he thinks to himself, all right, here's an opportunity for me to get ahead. Here's an opportunity for me to get away from Dieter. I'm, I won't have to rely on his knowledge uh, and abilities anymore. If I can break into this place, I'm sure it's full of all sorts of powerful artifacts. I can steal them and from them I can learn things and grow more powerful. So Zacharias spends that time studying uh, the defenses of the tower and he conjures up a very clever spell that he uses to blind all of the undead guardians. So basically they're still functioning and the necromancer that controls them would not be aware that they've been tampered with because if you kill an undead uh, that can often alert whoever it was that raised them uh, because they can feel that magical connection being severed. So instead he simply blinds them and then goes to sneak into the tower. However, <laughs> uh, Zacharias was not aware of the fact that the master of this tower, who we'll speak about in a moment, also had living servants uh, and living acolytes who immediately catch Zacharias because he's not particularly stealthy and he was not expecting to run into actually actual living human beings. So he gets captured and brought before the master of the tower, Melchior the Ancient. Uh, Melchior is a name you should be very familiar with if you're a vampire fan because he is a huge deal. Uh, Melchior it was the number one acolyte of uh, Wazorin, and Wazorin was the father of the Necrarch bloodline. He is the original. Uh, Wazorin was the most powerful magically of the first generation vampires. He kind of gets crapped on a lot uh, from a narrative standpoint. He, he's a little bit of a He's a little bit of a teacher's pet when it comes to Nagash. Uh, he was the only vampire that actually remained loyal to Nagash in the end. Um, even though when Nagash died, he then like just grabbed all of his books, or at least as much as he could carry from Nagash's sanctuary and ran off. But uh, Wazorin was ultimately betrayed by Melchior, and uh, Melchior dueled Wazorin and killed him and to steal all his stuff. However, it didn't go super great for Melchior because he underestimated Wazorin and Wazorin used a really powerful spell to kind of put his consciousness into Melchior. Um, some stories kind of disagree on exactly how that played out as far as did Wazorin switch him and Melchior's uh, brains so that Melchior was in Wazorin's body and then was killed or did he simply possess Melchior's body uh, and the two of them are both in there fighting for control. In my opinion, the second story is by far the most accurate because Melchior is fucking nuts. He is a rambling, uh, he's very, very powerful, but he is completely off his rocker. He is constantly flying into range, uh, rages just off the handle for seemingly no reason. And he is like babbling to himself and he's not all there. He really, he feels like it's two different people in a single body who are fighting for control. And when they're really getting into a tussle or he's kind of fracturing under that pressure, he lashes out at whatever's around him. Um, and this is why Melchior really isn't really, he's not a huge threat to the wider world is that he's kind of trapped almost within his tower due to his own insanity. So anyway, uh, Melchior meets this prisoner, Zacharias, and Melchior is frankly very impressed by Zacharias' little shenanigans. And he can tell just by looking at him that Zacharias has a significant amount of potential. He is very, very gifted uh, at controlling necromancy and the winds of magic. So Melchior, without really explanation or uh, anything, just on a whim, decides to give Zacharias the blood kiss. So he functionally kills him and turns him into a necrarch. <laughs> Zacharias... Uh, becomes a vampire very suddenly. Uh, Zacharias, despite the fact that many necromancers, <sighs> necromancers have a very complicated relationship with vampires in that becoming a vampire is not always viewed as a positive by necromancers. They are aware that it comes at a price um, because a lot of people wonder why don't necromancers just find a way to become a vampire. And many do, you know, many are constantly seeking out vampires and trying to like bargain in exchange for a blood kiss or hoping to find one. 
Uh, but there are quite a few necromancers who look down on the blood kiss. They either kind of see it as a way of cheating or they view the process that vampires go through as like a strong negative in that it, it kills you and it, it disconnects you, uh, your soul from the ether. So there are, there, there, there are prices you must pay, sacrifices that must be given in order to become a vampire. And in addition, you are bound to whoever uh, turns you as well as the effects that your bloodline will have on you. Case in point, Zacharias awakens um, newly undead and looks upon his body and he's horrific. Um, we'll have some artwork of Zacharias as I'm talking about him, I'm sure. But uh, Zacharias is not pleasant on the eyes. He is a nightmarish looking creature, which is very normal for Necrarchs. They tend to be quite hideous uh, because they tend to feed on dark magic rather than people. And that corruption has a very notable effect on their appearance. But the Necrarch bloodline in general just causes them to be very withered, almost mummy looking uh entities and Zacharias was genuinely horrified by his new appearance disgusted by it and the fact that this was done to him without his consent raised pissed him off pretty significantly uh he did not at least at that time he did not wish to become a vampire um and so at that moment he decided that he would get his revenge on Melchior uh though he would be patient because he knew already that Melchior was significantly more powerful than him. So he bided his time. Uh, from there, the story actually kind of takes a page from some myths or fables from our own world, uh, where because of Melchior's raging insanity, he had kind of a thing where every single night or every day, rather he would come to Zacharias, uh, within Melchior's tower. And he would say to him, uh, you bore me. I care for you no longer. I'm going to kill you. And Zacharias would say, but master, check out this new cool trick I just learned. And he would impress Melchior with some notable leap that he had made uh, in his arts over the control of necromancy, his study of um, uh, flesh crafting and all of this other stuff. So Melchior would say, ah, you, you know, excellent. You're, you're an excellent student. And he would be so impressed that he would allow Zacharias to live. And this happened day after day after day after day after day uh because once again melchior is completely nuts and uh he uh that was the only way zacharias would be able to survive is that he had to constantly keep impressing his master but kind of on the bright side depending on how you look at it um <laughs> this also pushed zacharias to incredible lengths uh, because he was so desperate not only to have his vengeance but to survive that he had to just go to absolutely maddening lengths uh, of study and uh, pushing himself in order to consistently impress his master night after night after night. Uh, which is, you know, genuinely fascinating. Uh, so, uh, from that we uh they this continues on for a while until melchior has taught zacharias a lot uh zacharias has become an incredibly powerful necrarch uh, vampire uh i want to say i want to say it takes a no 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 it, it it's it it doesn't say exactly how long it takes but he's with him for a while um but zacharias kind of starts looking probing for weaknesses with melchior um, and the thing that he comes to realize is that while Melchior has shared much with him and taught him much, there is a single room where there are artifacts, or at least a artifact, uh, where Zacharias is not allowed to go. Uh, it is Melchior's private chamber, and he is forbidden from entering there ever. So Zacharias makes a very careful note that most, if not every evening, Melchior will kind of frazz out. He'll just go nuts for a little bit and he'll enter a rage. And when he enters these rages, he ends up pursuing the living people within his tower and killing and feeding on them just in a blind, uh, just like completely batshit crazy. Uh, and he's, you know, not himself and not thinking straight when that happens. So Zacharias thinks to himself, ah, this, this is the perfect opportunity. 
So he waits for Melchior to have one of these rages, one of these moments where his insanity just completely tips over the tips over the scale. And while Melchior is stalking the living attendants within the tower, Zacharias breaks into his chamber and goes to claim one of the original nine books of Nagash, uh, which Zacharias is extremely excited about getting his hands on because there are no more potent um, artifacts of necromancy than those books. So, unfortunately, though, Melchior was not as, uh, Melchior is crazy, but he's not as unaware as Zacharias had hoped, because literally as soon as Zacharias gets his hands on the books, he turns around and Melchior is right there, and the two of them immediately erupt into this insane magical duel. Um, so they have this epic confrontation. And although Zacharias puts up a hell of a fight and he actually does manage to wound Melchior quite severely, Zacharias ultimately loses and realizes that he's going to die. And so he flees from Melchior's tower. Melchior himself is too wounded to pursue. So he sends all of his various agents undead and living after Zacharias and tells them to hunt him down and kill him or bring him back to the tower so that he could kill him. So Zacharias flees into the forest of shadows and is basically on the run uh, for an entire year. And uh, he is relentlessly pursued because even because he has to stop during the day. Uh, he can't, you know, risk getting hit by sunlight, especially in his weakened state. And he's still quite vulnerable to a number of things after expending as much effort as he did fighting Melchior. And he also can't afford to leave much of a trail. So he can't feed on humans. He only could really feed on wildlife. And because he has to rest during the day, the uh, the living servants in particular of Melchior are not inhibited by such restrictions, so they're able to relentlessly pursue him no matter where he goes. Eventually, though, Zacharias does escape after a year of pursuit, and he escapes into the mountains, where he finds a cave, and he basically drags himself into it, um, into this dark, secluded space, and exhausted, he goes into a deep slumber. Uh, he kind of goes into a healing coma, so to speak. And he remains there for 10 years. When he awakens, he is shocked to discover that a ancient uh, emperor, which we would consider an emperor class dragon, has taken up residence in that cave. It actually has always lived in that cave, but it was away hunting in uh, the east and the Darklands uh, and maybe even further beyond. But it had recently returned and was now slumbering on top of Zacharias. Uh, because as he had laid there for 10 years, he had basically kind of sunk into the cave. And uh, granted, he was trying to hide himself and the dragon did not notice his presence. So he awakens and he's so starving. He's so desperate for blood that he immediately feeds on the dragon like a leech. And the dragon is unaware of him. Uh, and he uses his own sorcery to keep the dragon asleep. And over the course of, I believe, a month, he completely drains the dragon of every single drop of its blood. So he feeds on the entirety of an ancient dragon, which is insane. Um, the only other vampire that has fed upon a dragon equally as powerful is Aberash. And Zacharias discovers what Aberash discovered, which is that if a vampire feeds on a dragon of that power um, and caliber, they will cure their vampirism in the sense that they no longer require blood. Uh, they, they become like the purest form of a vampire, and their powers are taken to absolutely insane levels. So Zacharias, no longer requiring blood, and now being one of, the, one of only two uh, like higher vampires that have achieved this status, he uses his newfound power, because he has, now has a shit ton and is fully recovered, and is even insanely beyond what he ever was, he resurrects this uh, emperor dragon, jumps on it, and claims that as his mount, he leaves the mountain, goes straight to Melchior's tower, and just bombards it with magic. So Melchior comes out, they have another duel, but between his newly empowered state and the fact that he's riding a fucking dragon, uh, Zacharias levels the fortress. Um, he destroys a bunch of stuff. And he believes he kills Melchior. He doesn't actually successfully kill Melchior. Melchior does escape, um, but never really becomes relevant after that. Uh, and uh, Zacharias takes the ruins of Melchior's tower for his own and then rebuilds the keep into uh, a design that he prefers. And Melchior's keep becomes his. 
he also claims a series of artifacts, and that is Zacharias the Ever Living. So, long story short, he's a very big, super badass vampire uh, who rides on a big, scary dragon. Uh, his dragon is supposed to be uniquely larger uh, than any other zombie dragon because it's an emperor class or ancient dragon. It's not a regular one, um, though I doubt that would probably be represented, though it would probably just have a better stat line. It, I want to say it has a name in w at least one version of the story, but I do not recall it off the top of my head. It might just be known. I, I think if you go back to a certain book, it might have a name. But in any event, as far as uh, what he does, he's a super powerful magic caster. Uh, so, you know, very powerful lore vampires maybe would have access to a couple of unique bound spells. Uh, as far as items go, he has the circlet of Rathek, which grants him a lot of really, really powerful protections. Uh, it actually, fun fact, uh, has the blessings of the gods of Nehekara in it which is absolutely bonkers, uh, especially for a vampire to be wielding that is almost kind of, it's almost borderline sacrilegious, which is kind of awesome. Uh, and I don't know, it just makes for a really cool, powerful artifact, but it does grant him uh, a significant amount of protection. It makes him, um, it, it has a jewel. So the circlet itself is not super terribly important, but the, the jewel um, has uh all the protective power uh of the um uh of all the gods of nehekara it does of course have kind of a hilarious curse that because the vampires betrayed the land of nehekara whoever wears wears the circlet uh will eventually be betrayed themselves um which has so far proven to be correct because it was owned by wazorin then it was owned by melchior now it's owned by zacharias um but in any event uh, it affords a insane amount of magical protection to those who bear it. Uh, so, you know, maybe it could be like a really powerful ward save uh, or in as well, or it could like provide him like an armor buff or whatever. I think a ward save would probably be the most appropriate, maybe like an active buff where you activate and you get like a 44 or 66% ward save for a little bit. Uh, but just something fun like that that just offers you a lot of really powerful protections. Uh, when it comes to more offensive stuff, he has the Staff of Kafamon. Um, Kafamon really cool guy, uh, was actually an Arabian wizard and he wasn't evil or weird necromancer or anything. He was actually just a very, very powerful death wizard. Uh, he was like unrivaled in his mastery in the art of Shaish, but, uh, he died a very long time ago. Uh, it was discovered by explorers. They took the staff back with them to the empire and it kind of changed a lot of hands, but eventually, sorry, not, uh, explorers, nomads, uh, but, uh, eventually made its way back to the empire where it made its way into the hands of Melchior. And then it of course made its hand way into the hands of Zacharias. And it is a, a very powerful staff that holds a purple gem that pulses with the, uh, the, the light of Shaish and grants whoever wields it. Uh, an incredible amount of power. Um, it's very, very death centric. Uh, so I could see that maybe he, you know, maybe it like reduces the winds of magic cost for some of his spells. Maybe he could even have like a bound purple sun. That could be really cool. You know, a free purple sun once per battle would be pretty nice. Uh, or maybe a free fate of Buna. That could also be pretty cool. Uh, but it is very death magic centric. So it should probably have some kind of interaction uh, with death magic proper. Um, and then the last item that he has are the scrolls of Semtep, uh, which also originate from Nehekara. And these scrolls basically make it where, uh, whoever, uh, whenever they are read out, they, they're ultimate at countering spells. Um, the scary thing is there are multiples of them. Uh, so he actually carried like a number of them into battle. When Zacharias was on tabletop, uh, he was an absolute asshole because he got basically he generally a dispel scroll was an item where if you used it, it automatically stopped a spell, uh, with very rare circumstances, uh, countering it, uh, being irresistible forces, which were in later editions, but uh dispel scroll, you'd like cast a spell. And if they had dispel scroll, they'd go no once per game. Zacharias is such a dick that he could do that every turn. <laughs> every turn he would be like, nope, not happening. <laughs> no, sir, you do not get to cast that spell, uh, which is insane. Uh, so maybe giving him some, maybe the scrolls could be some kind of a, a, a an, maybe like an active ability where he uses them uh, and whatever, like he could target a character maybe once every 30 or 60 seconds. 
And whenever he targets a character, uh, maybe he like lowers their winds of magic recharge and he gives them like a five or 10 second cooldown on all their abilities. You know, something that would be vaguely annoying uh, to deal with, but not too overpowered. Uh, as far as his actual spells go, Zacharias would be a little tricky. Uh, I feel like, you know, we're kind of in the age of characters just get mixed lores if they're particularly powerful. Um, so maybe he could have a mix similar to the, um, Necrox that we currently have. I believe they have a mix of what, like, um, I think they have a mix of death and vampires. I want to say there might be one other in there. Uh, but I would give him a similar mix. I think death and vampires, a mix would be fine. Just give him like a very, very nice selection of spells. And then to make him stand out, probably give him some powerful bound spells as well as maybe some unique interactions with his own spells where he's able to cast them exceptionally cheap or exceptionally quickly. Uh, so maybe he has much lower cooldowns or the spells are, uh, like practically free. He has a longer casting range. There are a lot of, you know, maybe he has spell mastery. So his spells are more powerful and deal more damage. There are good ways to interact with that. Um, you know, give him, give him the lore master skill for both the lore of death and the lore of vampires, stuff like that. Um, he would still, I think feel fairly different from Manfred just because Manfred still has the entirety of the lores of death and vampires, which was a very unique gimmick to Manfred. Um, so I, I don't think you want to take that away. Al alternatively, you know, Zacharias could just be pure lore vampires, but I feel like we have enough pure lore vampire, vampire legendary lords. <laughs> um, in any event, that's Zacharias also rides a big scary zombie dragon. So what would come with Zacharias? What would I expect to see in the Necrock DLC when it comes to new units? Uh, I think a Necrock hero would be cool. A Necrock hero vampire, a Necrock thrall, um, where you have uh, a vampire who's very, very heavily built around uh, spell buffing. Uh, so maybe give them the spell mastery ability. Maybe they have like some skills that invest. So if you have them on the battlefield, they're very good at generating winds of magic or just empowering the spells of your wizard. Because like regular necromancer heroes, I would say, are actually quite good at generating spells. Uh, or generating winds of magic because they always tend to come with like, you know, abilities to hurt themselves uh, in exchange for uh, for winds, which is very solid. So maybe for a Necrarch vampire hero, the idea would be spell mastery, I think would probably be the best way to go with it. Kind of take from the Cathay, Cathay book of ideas where the more of them you have, the more powerful all of your spells get. Uh, so you're kind of encouraged to have them. Uh, I would probably also give them access to some powerful summons uh, because Necrarchs are Necrarchs are the mad scientists of the vampire counts. They are very, very heavily focused on innovating on what undeath is capable of, creating new forms of undead, more powerful forms of undead. Um, they're kind of the like if you were to take they're they're kind of the purest idea of taking a necromancer and just making them into a vampire is basically what a Necrarch is. Um, so you could look at it from that sense. Uh, but I think they would make for a really fun hero, uh, and that would make them fairly different from the generic vampire. And this would also allow us to have an opportunity to make the Necrarch Lord and the Necrarch hero have unique assets and have very, very dynamic appearances. Uh, so they're just very exotically different from the generic vampire and all of the other bloodlines, uh, which is very important. Then when it comes to units, uh, the first new unit I would recommend would be the Wickerman. So the, the Wickerman are these really terrifying, um, uh, automaton like creations. So they're constructs rather than typical undead. So the way I envision them is that you have, uh, the way they're described is kind of like, imagine a scarecrow but it's bigger than a scarecrow should be. So instead of man size, they're more like ogre size, but you have these scarecrow like things, except for their entire bodies tend to be made more out of like wood and metal. Um, so if you, if you don't like fiddlesticks, right from league of legends, very similar concept, uh, where you have these nightmarish creatures that have like, um, swords or farm implements that have for, so they have like these big bladed hands. Uh, they have like very bizarre 
um, like cobbled together bodies from a necromancer. So like a necrofex colossus, but smaller. Um, and it's a unit of them. Inst- a necro, no, not, not, not a colossus, a necro. Is that the right necrofex? Maybe that is right. Necrofex colossus. I want to say that's right. You know what I'm talking about? The vampire coast thing. I always get it mixed up with the bone giants original name. Anyway. Uh, so, um, um, you know what I'm talking about though? So like a smaller version of those and without shooting, but like they have these, so you'd have these big claws. Uh, they're fairly agile. They're able to move quite quickly because they're not made of flesh. They're able to animate faster than one would expect. Um, a lot of them in their traditional imagery have like pumpkin heads. Uh, so they, they have like, or carved heads out of some kind of material. And what's really cool about their design from a lore standpoint is that, um, they are functionally undead creatures, uh, but they are made entirely out of wood and metal and inanimate material. Um, what animates them though, is that there's actually a talisman or a relic of some sort hidden inside of them. Um, almost always it's either hidden in the head or it's hidden like around the neck area or in the chest. And what it is, is it is a piece of a living thing. So it's like a wing from a bat or the paw of a dog or the hand of a human, but it's, it's a piece of something. Um, and the necromancer usually has like the rest of the remains, um, uh, somewhere, but it allows for this connection with the necromancer that allows them to animate the entire piece. And it makes them very, very dangerous to deal with because you're dealing with a creature that does not bleed and it doesn't care what damage you deal to it. It's only weak spot is the talisman. If you strike and destroy the talisman, the whole thing just collapses and dies immediately. Grand, you know, you can't do it the hard way and just break it apart and shatter it. But uh, generally speaking, you're aiming for the talisman. Um, so I would really love these to be kind of um, uh, a monstrous infantry type unit. Uh, granted, they could be, you could go like just kind of traditional scarecrow size, but I think monstrous infantry would be a little more fitting for them and help them stand out a bit more. And what I would do for them is that they're very heavily armored. Um, so they're not like crypt horrors who have virtually no armor, but they're, you know, they have like massive health pools and they regenerate and they deal poison damage. And they're not like the Vargais who fly also have very little armor and are very explosive, um, damage stats. No, they are these shambling constructs that because they have a very limited weakness, um, uh, they have a very high armor stat, but probably not like m- tons of health. Uh, so like they don't have as much health. Uh, as the other two options, more, more likely, uh, but they make up for it by being very, very tanky uh, against like non-armor piercing type missiles uh, or weapons, I should say. Maybe they could have like missile resistance because, you know, they're made out of all these different uh, materials that make them or eh, I guess you could just say physical resistance. That's what they should probably have. I would say reasonably high armor, like notably high armor notable physical resistance because magical attacks would hurt them significantly because it would bypass a lot of what they're relying on uh, to keep themselves together. And if it disrupts the magic holding them apart, they collapse and die. Uh, I imagine they probably have pretty reasonable armor piercing because they probably have bladed hands and such. Um, But at the same, uh, so I Wickerman, there we go. I'm going to stop talking in circles. Wickerman, that's the first unit and like an actual unique original design. Um, The second thing, that I, uh, the second unit that I, uh, would recommend would be spirit hosts. Uh, spirit hosts have been a long time coming. Um, they're a very iconic tabletop unit. They've been around in the vampire counts since the undead were a faction, not even the vampire counts, just the undead. Uh, they are collections of screaming spirits, uh, that are, they're a swarm type unit. So think nerglings. Um, they are, they don't tend to deal a lot of damage. They are ethereal. Uh, so they would play by the ethereal rules where they have virtually no armor, um, but they have very high physical resistance. They have very little damage, but all the damage they deal is armor piercing. They would have, um, uh, the chill touch. So, you know, or, uh, frost, frost blade, whatever we call it in total war. So they slow you down if they hit you and they're, they're just tar pits. That should be their design. It's just a big swarm of spirits who tar pit. They're, you know, reasonably fast. They should be able to move across the battlefield quite quickly because they're not, you know, they're ghosts. They don't care about the terrain or anything. So they're able to swarm onto people. And um, when they they should not deal a lot of damage, 
but they just they just muck you up. They just keep you in the fight uh, and make it. You know, they're great for. They would be excellent for getting on shooting units and tying them up in combat. You know, they cause. They're great for causing fear. They might cause terror since they're ghosts. I'd have to double check that. I don't remember if they cause terror or not. I think they just cause fear. Um, but I would have to double check. In fact, I'm going to double check while I continue rambling. But um, they're they're a unit that I have always heavily desired to see join the vampire count roster, uh, and I think would make an excellent addition. I don't think they would require like a ton of new work because they could I think rely very heavily uh, on kind of a lot of the designs of the Karen race and such. Um, though they attack with claws, uh, though uh, some some versions of them attack with claws. Though a lot of them have little daggers. So, um, but I, I think they would make for just an absolutely fantastic addition. Uh, and there's such like a classic aspect of the roster that really needs to be represented. No, they don't cause terror. They only cause fear. Great. So they're not like super overpowered by any means, but they're, they're just tanky. That's, that's the whole thing. They're, they're very tanky and they're ethereal, very solid. Um, and then the final unit I would include for them would be a new mount as well as a monster, which, uh, one of only two big things. Uh, which is the Abyssal Terror. So the Abyssal Terror is a super duper duper classic monster uh, for the Vampire Counts. It's been around for a crazy long time. And uh, the Abyssal Terror is the equivalent of a Griffin or Wyvern for the uh, Vampire Counts. And uh, what it brings to the table, opposed to like the Dragon, for instance, is A, it's a lot cheaper. Um, they have a very unique kind of iconic design. They're very gargoyle like, um, in that they, they, they have like really big wings and they're, they have like tusks and these weird like pterodactyl heads, but, um, creative assembly could very heavily reimagine them. Their concept is basically a necromancer takes a bunch of different bits of various monsters. So like they take some pieces of Griffin and some pieces of Wyvern and some pieces of Hippogriff and some pieces of, uh, Pegasus or whatever they happen to have lying around and they composite together a Griffin sized creature, uh, which is why it's considered kind of the ultimate expression of necromancy because it's not one singular keep creature resurrected. It is a conglomerate of creatures that have been um, stitched or um, melded together using dark magic to create something new and terrifying. Um, so they're flying monstrous creatures very on. If, if you're like, what would they do? Literally think of Wyvern or a Griffin. So flying monster, very good at like tearing through infantry and fighting other characters and such. Um, they have. Uh, they tend to have venomous tails due to wyvern bits, so they can have poison attacks, which is always a you know always a plus. Um, they you know armor piercing, good against infantry, can fly. The thing that's very very cool about them is that they were also available to master necromancers uh, as a mount option. So that I think would actually help the master necromancer a bunch because it would provide them uh, with a monstrous mount, which they do not have in their current iteration. You know they only have. They go up to a Hellsteed and then they stop, uh, whereas the Vampire goes all the way up to the Dragon. So for the Vampire Lords, it would give you like a nice stepping stone uh, tier monster between Hellsteed, Hellsteed and Vamp uh, Zombie Dragon, which would be awesome. And for the Master Necromancer, it would be your ultimate mount, uh, which would help them feel significantly better because having a armor piercing poisonous monster uh, that flies would give the Master Necromancer a lot more staying power. Uh, because it's like, oh, I've got poison to debuff anyone that's attacking me and the creature is significantly stronger so I can like defend myself better. Uh, and I think would make that character a lot more viable. Um, so yeah, uh, that is what I expect for them roster. I would pray for them to get roster wise. As far as mechanics go, uh, I would steal a page from the champions of chaos book. And by that, I mean, I'm going to steal a page from someone else and I would give them a greater necromancy as their unique mechanic. And the way greater necromancy would work is it would functionally be a uh, throat the uncleans workshop uh, where you are able to select units in your roster and use some new resource um, material um, or just your dark magic. I don't know. And you're able to upgrade your creatures 
as the Necrarchs use dark magic and kind of surgery in a sense to augment them with other parts. So you give units poison attacks, you give them more armor piercing, uh, you give them like all sorts of crazy different effects, you give them the ability to regenerate in close combat, you give them the ability to... Um, uh, I don't know, they get Strider, or they could become Ethereal, or they could, you know, go crazy with it. Uh, but I would think that would be a very awesome, very lore-accurate um, mechanic for them. Because the Necrox, that's what they do, is that they create new forms of undead. They use their magic to summon more powerful forms of spirits, or to take the undead they already have and meld other things with them to grant them new powers and abilities. Uh, my favorite that is referenced in Night's Dark Masters is there's a Necrarch who literally creates a spider ogre. Uh, so it's a giant spider. Um, it, it's like a centaur, but with the upper body of an ogre and the lower body of a giant spider, which is terrifying. Uh, but it's like, oh, so, you know, functionally, that's kind of like an ogre with poisonous attacks and, so, you know, some other nasty abilities. Grant, that would be a little more extreme than what I'm suggesting. Uh, but the idea is there. Um, and I think that would make for an awesome mechanic and a really awesome faction. So that is the Necrarchs. Um, I think they'd be super awesome. I think they should invest very heavily into having like lots of buffs for magic and sorcery and stuff. Um, so maybe they even get, maybe they give little bonuses to their necromancer characters as well, though not nearly as much, you know, that I think that should definitely stay Kimler and, uh, Gorse thing. You know, they should be the necromancer characters. Um, legendary hero uh because that's a thing now uh that legendary heroes often come with i'm gonna be really straight with you guys because there's a lot of options but i i just want him in the game and i i feel like he would be really cool and that's give me dieter helschnitt give me let zacharias call on his old master <laughs> let him let him call the man the myth the legend you know they say hey you know he his he would be so good to do because he would just have a whole quest line of like Hey, if you're willing to pick on the empire for me, um, I'll join with you. Uh, as far as start position goes, I would love to see Zacharias in the Forest of Shadows, which is like the north of the empire, anywhere in the, uh, in that Mindheim, Ostermark, Oslin ballpark. Um, granted, is it is very crowded over there with Festus and the guys, uh, so Zacharias could start somewhere else entirely. Um, I mean, he does go around the world exploring for magical artifacts and stuff, so it wouldn't shock me at all to see him turn up somewhere super duper weird. But uh, that will conclude this little video. Uh, let me know what y'all think down below. Do you love the idea? Do you hate the idea? Do you think the units would be really cool? Um, I, like I said, I'll be doing a video like this for every single one of the bloodlines, except the Von Karsteins. Von Karsteins are not going to get that. Uh, because they are already very heavily developed and they don't need anything else. Um, I even think like their bloodline Lord is totally fine. Um, and the, like the generic hero kind of basically represents the Von Karstein bloodline. Um, I, I don't like, I, I think it'd be nice for the Von Karstein to get access to some unique traits, just like how Zinch, Korn, Nurgle, and Slanesh have unique traits for their characters. I think all the unique bloodlines having unique traits would be kind of cool. Um, and that way you could like, oh, this, this generic vampire is not a generic vampire. It is a Von Karstein vampire because I have the unique trait. Um, and hell, you know, I don't know, give them, maybe they could get a, maybe we could get a Von Karstein hero level vampire as well. Um, I still think the, gen I, I do want to say, I think the generic should stay in the game because they always are great for representing vampires that are like so muddled that nobody knows who their ancestry is, or they've been fathered essentially by like multiple bloodlines, which can happen. Um, it's, it's not, it actually happens a lot. Uh, most modern vampires in Warhammer fantasy do not have like a single progenitor, so to speak. Um, they tend to be the byproduct of like multiple lines, um, which I know sounds complicated, but uh, one, one of these days I'll do a video on that because it's an interesting subject. But uh, uh, I think I think they should be left alone and they can also kind of represent the make your own bloodline uh, because we don't know what happened to like the Southlands um, bloodline. And I don't think we ever will. I, I think it's kind of better for the lore that the Southlands vampires kind of forever remain unexplored because they're kind of meant to serve as the player insert. Like if you want to make up your own bloodline and give them their own unique, crazy characteristics, that's the bloodline you're supposed to use. And for the Jade Vampires, I promise we'll talk about them, um, but I am a very strong believer that they should be a Vampire Coast faction, not Vampire Counts. Uh, and I will explain that in their own video dedicated to them, so this is not the place to, 
talk about that. Please don't fuck up my comment section with Jade Vampire Talk. Um, anyway, thank you for watching. I hope this was enjoyable. I know it was a ramble, but y'all seem to like when I ramble. And I, I totally fucking lied earlier and I was like, I won't talk for an hour and it's 55 minutes. Um, <laughs> I have a problem. Um, I, sp I spent way too much time talking about Zacharias' backstory. Anywho, uh, I will see you all next time for the next Bloodline. Take care. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.